Um, welcome, welcome to uh, day two of the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Symposium. And also uh, welcome to um, our Engaged Scholar Day. Um, we have uh, two events going on sort of in parallel for this morning. And then we, uh, we split off into separate events for the afternoon. Um, I should mention that this is uh, a week filled with conferences. And um, on Wednesday and Thursday of this week, uh, we have the uh, Technology and Learning Conference that's uh, happening here as well. And if you uh, fail to get registered for it, please check with someone out at the front table right away today if you're interested. Um, that conference, unlike these, uh, does have a registration fee. So um, we are um, interested in, uh, in your participation nonetheless. And I do want to mention that the two keynote speakers for the uh, TLT conference, the Technology and Learning Conference, will be uh, streamed live um, on the internet as well for, for people who are not able to attend in person. Um, again, thank you for coming out this morning. And um, as I know, people will continue to stream in a little bit as we, as we carry on here. Um, I want to uh, uh, thank you for coming out today. Uh, it's, a, it's an exciting program. Um, our first speaker this morning is our Vice Provost Teaching and Learning, Patty McDougall. Um, and Patty has uh, designed her talk carefully to kind of address uh, two, two sets of things, I think. Uh, how the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, integrates with um, the, our whole mission for outreach and engagement. Um, I'm uh, very much looking forward to hearing Patty's first major address to the campus uh, since her appointment. I think this is really the first, the first major presentation that she's been able to make uh, publicly to the campus. And so I'd like you to welcome Patty here this morning and uh, thank her for coming out to speak to us today. Good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to uh, day two of our uh, subtle symposium and day one of our uh, Community Engaged Scholar Day. Um, what I would like to do uh, today is to talk to you a little bit about the path that we're on at the University of Saskatchewan uh, to develop a vision uh, for the scholarship of teaching and learning along with an action plan to realize that vision. Uh, my intention today is to set down some aspirations as well as to give you some examples of best and successful practice. Um, some of those will come from our U15 comparators. So as a member of the U15, um, we are now looking, um, uh, when, we, when we want to compare ourselves, we look to those peers to see what they're doing. So some of my examples will come from the University of Waterloo, McMaster, UBC. Of course, some of our examples will come from what we're already doing here at the University of Saskatchewan. My list of those examples won't be exhaustive, um, but I'll try to hit some highlights for you. And I do consider this presentation the first step in a series of many steps that will involve engaging other people in developing this vision. Um, but even at this early stage, I wanted to appropriately thank some people um, who have uh, contributed to, whose minds um, I have tapped into in creating um, some of the aspects of this. So first of all, my, my colleagues, Jim Greer, Brad Weatherick, uh, who I don't see in the room at present from the University Learning Center, Keith Carlson, our special advisor on outreach and engagement, our vice president, Karen Chad. Now, if you're wondering, if you're looking at these pictures and you're wondering, did she, did she look? <laughs> for the absolute oldest picture she could find. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. So there's Jim. Not sure exactly what era. Uh, there's Karen. Of course, Karen, our vice president research is not aging at all. The only thing that's changed about Karen is close. I think this might be a little bit circa 1990. It certainly was for me. Keith. Uh, is never aging. It's very strange. Uh, and Brad, of course, hasn't been here long enough that I was able to find an older photo. But I do want to report that when I cut and pasted this, I wish he was here, when I cut and pasted this photo into my PowerPoint, it took the entire slide, it took the slides around it, and enveloped everything else. And I thought, 
how appropriate for a picture of Adam <laughs> Clark. Because we always tease him about a significant self-perception of himself. <laughs> so I thought it was appropriate. But uh, just, just over a year ago, um, uh, for, in the search for the position I currently hold, I floated a vision statement that focused on the quality of student learning, quality of our student learning experience. And in my view, the work that we do in the area of the scholarship of teaching and learning helps us move that broader vision forward. So today, of course, I'll be talking about something more, more focused uh, around a vision um, in the scholarship of teaching and learning. And I'd like to start by suggesting that in five years' time, the scholarship of teaching and learning becomes a vital and highly regarded component of the research mission at the University of Saskatchewan. That's the first part of the vision. And second, that the scholarship of teaching and learning is integral to developing and delivering on excellence in education quality and will be rooted in our academic ethos and practice. So let me just step back for a moment uh, and make sure that, that members of the audience understand what I mean when I say the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, those of you who were fortunate enough to be in attendance yesterday when our colleague Dan Bernstein from, from KU, University of Kansas, delivered his address, um, we'll see some uh, complementarity in these two things. I realize that, but I also knew there would be some newcomers today. So I certainly understand from this literature that defining the scholarship of teaching and learning has been challenging. I'm choosing to look at the scholarship of teaching and learning in such a way that it honors research in the classroom or uh, research on course-based pedagogical practices, as well as leaving the door wide open to include activities like program level reform, curriculum renewal, education leadership. So not just what happens in the classroom, but also what can happen broadly across the institution. And so when I speak about the scholarship of teaching and learning, I'm including things like the study of curriculum and pedagogy, understanding student learning and enhancing the quality of learning experiences, assessing effective practice um, in specific circumstances because we know that context matters when we're looking at these things, and also providing opportunities for dissemination of pedagogical research to the broader scholarly community, both informally and formally. So there is a desire inside the scholarship of teaching and learning. There's a, there's a drive towards continuous improvement that moves from reflection to inquiry to evidence. And I think that I, I would suggest to you that I'm uh, certainly uh, attracted to uh, Hutchings and Schulman's three core characteristics when they speak about the scholarship of teaching and learning, when we all speak about it, that it's about being public, being open to critique and evaluation, and, and being in a form that others can build on. And when I prepared this, this talk, I um, thought, well, I should give you examples. Um, you'll you'll, you'll want to have some concrete local examples. And then I realized that yesterday was a day full of examples. So for those of you who took part in yesterday's presentation, you got a lot of ideas about, about what's going on here at the University of Saskatchewan. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll give you a couple of highlights. Um, I would point to my colleague Marcel Dion, who's in the audience, who is the director of our Center for Discovery and Learning. And in the College of Medicine, they're studying the use of self-assessments as a a proxy for measuring graduate objectives, asking the questions of when, how, and with whom do we get the most accurate form of data to evaluate how the program is working and whether the goals and objectives are being reached. An excellent example. We have colleagues in nursing, a recent award winner, Sandra uh, Basandowski, studying the roles of learning technology. We have uh, Fred Phillips in the Edwards School of Business studying, researching the impact of flipped classrooms and on learning outcomes. So when I prepared this, I asked myself the question, uh, which is extremely relevant at the University of Saskatchewan, about how the scholarship of teaching and learning, how does that fit inside a research intensive institution uh, like our own? In other words, is it a good fit at the University of Saskatchewan? And the short answer to that is, is yes, it most certainly is. And like our colleagues at the University of British Columbia, I propose to you that the fact that the University of Saskatchewan makes a commitment, an institutional commitment to being research intensive, in no way will stand in the way of our goal of improving undergraduate and graduate education. Um, in fact, that commitment actually strengthens our efforts in the area of the scholarship of teaching and learning. So uh, Hubble, Pearson, and Clark very recently 
um, in, in the, the landmark or the inaugural issue of, of teaching and learning inquiry that, that Dan held up for you yesterday. So hot off the press, um, put, point out some of the important features of the educational landscape in a research intensive institution that pulls for good fit when it comes to the scholarship of teaching and learning. So you have an environment that is complex and rapidly changing. You have a rich student diversity, a growing course, you have growing course and program offerings, the use of technology to expand, expand classroom borders. There are other examples. But all of these things are taking place in our own environment. They are taking place within the context of rising demands for institutional accountability. So it turns out, of course, um, that measuring the impact of the scholarship of teaching and learning is still, is still a work in progress. But we know uh, some things about um, individual and institutional benefits. So why, why do we value this? Why do we want more of this in our environment? Uh, Pat Hutchins and colleagues have talked about the individual benefits, how the scholarship of teaching and learning strengthens individual practice, how teaching becomes um, engaging, intellectually engaging and energizing, and how it is that through the scholarship of teaching and learning, teaching becomes less solitary. In addition to some of the individual outcomes, there's Dan. He's down here in the front row. I looked for the oldest picture I could find. Um, and, and look at that. Now, is that a high-tech environment at the University of Kansas? Those tables and chairs? So, there, so there's Dan, our esteemed visitor. Um, and, and in this particular 2013 first issue that I just referred to, Dan makes a powerful case for how it is that the scholarship of teaching and learning can be an asset in a university environment. So what are the institutional benefits? Dan points to the idea of investing in capacity, and I think it's a strong argument. Um, he is suggesting that um, um, the, the fact that a university includes and in, embraces the scholarship of teaching and learning, in fact, is an investment in that growing capacity. Others, uh, Pat Hutchins and colleagues, have talked about how there's an improvement in faculty development, how it enhances uh, learning experiences for students, uh, promotes an evidence-based approach to quality, advances institutional agendas, becomes a catalyst for change in an institution like ours. And again, back to the point, a point that Dan makes in his recent article, it enhances the reputation of the institution. In particular, when you have uh, the work of faculty being read outside the home institution, so on, based on the scholarship of teaching and learning, if we have our own work being read uh, outside of our own institution, it provides a concrete example to stakeholders about what innovation looks like. As Jim mentioned, given that my presentation today straddles the activities of the scholarship between the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Symposium and today's Symposium on Community Engaged Scholarship, it certainly made considerable sense for me to stop for a moment and think about what are the connections between these two forms of, of scholarship. And I, I wanted to point to, uh, to Boyer's uh, 1990 articulation that, that is, has become, of course, quite famous in higher education about different types of scholarship. Boyer talked about discovery, talked about teaching, talked about application and integration and the scholarship of, of all of those four. The form of, that I would argue, of course, that's closest to community-engaged scholarship is what Boyer identified as the scholarship of application. And he tied this scholarship of application to service, suggesting that, that application was about researching problems that affect individuals, institutions, societies. In my view, both the scholarship of teaching and learning and community-engaged scholarship, they share an applied nature. Um, there is a demand or requirement for the application of findings that I don't think that I don't think resides in the scholarship of inquiry. It's not that we don't want to apply findings in that core and basic areas of research, but we're not called to uh, in the same way as we are for the scholarship of teaching and learning and community-engaged scholarship. In the subtle work that we do, we're called to go beyond traditional dissemination outlets to influence practice in community. It's about returning the work back to community. Um, uh, in a sense, it's, it's about the definition of community. We're serving different communities. Yesterday, Dan Bernstein referred to some of this activity as transitional writing. How can I communicate my findings so that they have meaning to a broader audience, broader than just um, 
the 20 colleagues who might read my peer-reviewed journal article. This to me is very similar. So that call to translation is very similar to the expectations that surround community-engaged scholarship. And I would further argue that both the scholarship of teaching and learning and community-engaged scholarship are in a peripheral space in our academic world, certainly here at the University of Saskatchewan. Both are frequently scrutinized as to whether they represent real, real research. Um, and uh, in both cases, these, these areas of scholarship are yet to enjoy full integration as core research within our academic culture. So as I go through today and talk about, okay, how will we integrate the scholarship of research into the core of our activities, many of the things that I'm talking about, audience members will know, can equally be applied to community-engaged scholarship. If it's the case that we aspire to more scholarship of teaching and learning activity, to excellence in that area, because we think it adds value to what we're doing, um, how do we do this? How do we integrate this line of scholarship into the heart of our culture? I want to, I think that we begin by looking at our starting point. What is, what is our baseline? And some of you will have been to a session yesterday um, and heard Brad, Brad Weatherock has joined us. Um, he missed the part where I teased him, um, so that's too bad. But uh, yesterday, <laughs> Um, Brad delivered a, a session inside uh, the symposium where he would have talked about some of the research he did last summer, uh, co-sponsored by the uh, Office of the Vice President Research. But I'll just highlight a few points to you because I view this as what are we starting from? Uh, where, where will we be springing off of? Through a series of sampling methods, Brad and colleagues were able to identify that we had 247 faculty members, 37 staff members, who reported being involved in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, this certainly inside the faculty category, this is a mix of um, uh, tenure stream, tenured appointments, and uh, contingent contract appointments. But I, through a process of sort of calculating backwards, was able to figure out that it's about 16% of our tenure tenured stream faculty complement that is involved in the scholarship of teaching and learning. 70% of the, of the group that was identified responded to an electronic survey. And of these, 47% said that, so, so just, just a slight bit less than half said that a quarter of their scholarly work was in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Just over a quarter of the people, 27%, said half or more of their scholarly work is involved in, in research activity around the scholarship of teaching and learning. And Brad took the respondents and divided them into, uh, into categories uh, based on Trigwell's model, which I think is also particularly helpful. And at level one, uh, we had at the first tier, we had uh, almost half of respondents in that group. And here, people were talking about the, their dissemination activities as being primarily aimed at conversations with colleagues inside departments and institutions or non-peer-reviewed uh, outlets. At uh, the second tier, level two, we had 28% of respondents categorized uh, as sharing their work in peer-reviewed venues beyond the institution, still inside the boundaries of their discipline. Um, and 24% reporting that they were disseminating into peer-reviewed higher education and teaching outlets, including journals and conferences that were outside of their own discipline. A good segment of these individuals um, that we heard from in this particular uh, sort of uh, baseline assessment were doing work collaboratively. Were commonly un and so they were undertaking this work with people outside their own discipline. And there's increasing value on our campus being placed on what's what's called team science. Right? It's a sort of a new buzzword for for collaboration. Old wine, new bottles. So it's called team science, and and the emphasis and the interest that's being placed on that in, on our own campus. Um, means that we are well positioned in the scholarship of teaching and learning because that's largely driving much of the work that's being done. Let me stop there. Um, Jim put some pressure on me and said, you can't, you can't talk for the whole hour. There's just no way. So we're going to do a think pair share. And I'm, what I'm going like to do is, given that you know we're heading in this direction of wanting to increase the activity around scholarship of teaching and learning, in particular the excellence around the scholarship of teaching and learning, I'm going to ask you for the next couple of moments, you've got the card. If you don't have a card, you can just write it on a piece of paper. I'm going to ask you to jot down a thought about what do you think is the greatest barrier to our moving forward, 
to increasing high quality scholarship of teaching and learning on campus? And how might we overcome this barrier? So I'm just going to ask you to jot something down and then talk to the person or people that are, are closest to you. Um, and in, at the end, if you're interested, if you're willing, I'm actually going to ask you to hand back those cards for those of you who are prepared to do that because it's going to help us to inform the inclusivity of that vision. So I'll give you about five minutes to, to work on that. Thank you. Okay. Sorry to cut off the conversation. I wonder if there's one or two people in the audience who would be prepared to volunteer uh, what, their, what the barrier, what they found to be the most uh, powerful or compelling barrier. Yes, ma'am, you at the back. What a surprise. Um, I the what a surprise. <laughs> Okay, let's have it. And that was that I think the contagious enthusiasm when people talk about exciting teaching experiences and when they discuss their programs and they're looking at growth and how to change and renew. Good. So that's what I feel really builds enthusiasm Good. for doing this. And then we can link those things into uh, research and what happens Good. when we make those changes. Yeah. And I'd just like to offer up that we might want to change the conversation to focusing on what's positive about what's going on. Yesterday was such a brilliant example. I mean, it was just awesome. So how, I, how might we increase the effect of this driving force? By providing opportunities to talk teaching, to initiate conversations about exciting teaching experiences, to ask our students what they found to be helpful, and to connect people with similar experiences. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Did you write that all down? It's all written. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else want to offer up a thought on, on solutions, barriers? Yes. I think uh, time frame is also an important issue because if you want to study scholarship of teaching and learning, it would be a good idea to track students over a period of time, mm -hmm. different groups, but that takes time. If you're going to have 20 students in a class and it's offered only one semester in a year, you need three, four years. And so the, the system right. has to right. be able to and be willing to accept that it takes longer. Yes. Um, again, related to time, um, if you want to track students over a period of time and do longitudinal studies, then the system has to have the database that is available to researchers so that they can track these people over a period of time. Excellent, excellent. So I'm actually a, a developmental and educational psychologist by training, so your, your um, ideas about what it requires to, to actually follow students in a meaningful way over time make a, make a good deal of sense to me. And I think what you're suggesting is that, that there's a collaboration required. And I, and I think that's... I had one third point here. Oh, sorry, to okay. To follow up, uh, if we were to actually go back to the school system and start you know, studying learning styles at a very young age, then it would be important for us to have relationships with that school system so that we have access to data and we have systems in place here so that when those students come here, we can track them during their stay here Good. as well. Good. I like it. So thank you for those people those who offered up their, their suggestions and to all of you who had those discussions. As we go through this next part of, of what I wanted to present today, I'll be curious to know whether I hit on some of the topics of conversation that, that you had. And when I turn my attention to increasing activity and, and to the integration aspect of this and the question of cultivating excellence, I actually return back to some, some principles um, that I think can be applied in multiple domains. And so um, to start, I think, uh, and, and in part, not entirely, but in part this speaks to the point that, that Cheryl was raising. I think in part it's about igniting people's passion uh, for teaching. And um, I recognize, by the way, that, that the scholarship of teaching and learning is not the path for, for every single person on the campus of the University of Saskatchewan. That's not, that's not the vision that I'm trying to launch. I also understand that it's outside the comfort zone for at least some of our colleagues. At one of yesterday's um, sessions, uh, a colleague who shall remain nameless said, I'm about a mile and a half outside my comfort zone. And, and I understood what that person was, was saying. And of course, I indicated that he was 
he was in exactly the right place to be a mile outside the comfort zone. But nevertheless, I get that not everyone, uh, it's not the path for everyone. But at the same time, for those who do want to do the work, I think that um, we uh, need to begin by starting to make it easier for people to do this work. And, and I think some of the ways to make it easier are by building capacity, by building resources. So there can be people uh, capacity building exercises. Um, and, and of course, you've heard me mention, um, I didn't want to overlook the fact that we have a, a center for discovery and learning at the University of Saskatchewan, and we're continuing to grow that center as a way of building capacity in this way. But for starters, we can build capacity by offering workshops. This is something that the Gwena Moss Center does with, with extensive success. I'm thinking about events that are designed to give people the basics, to, that are designed to be pragmatic and, in, and interactive. Um, I think that McMaster does a, a, does a great job um, on consultation. So at McMaster, they've got individualized consultation and mentorship at their particular center uh, from, for around potential and ongoing teaching and learning projects right from the very beginning to the end. They'll offer you that individual consultation. I think that sending people to national and international conferences helps build people capacity. Not only are they in a position to share their work, but they're out there bringing back the work of others to our own institution. That's capacity building. UBC takes this notion a whole step further by um, offering a credential around uh, a research skill set. So they have a faculty scholarship of of teaching and learning leadership program that they offer uh, as a certificate program. I think there are background resources that are sort of at the ready. And here we see the possibility of great connections with, with our library. So um, at the University of Waterloo, their Center for Teaching Excellence has a spot on their website where they make it very easy for colleagues to access discipline and non-discipline based journals in, in uh, teaching and learning. It's connected right to the library, right? So this is about making it easy. McMaster provides a listing of publication outlets for where you might want to put your work, especially if you're new to the game, you might want to have a sense of where will I publish this work. I think that's particularly helpful. I think financial resources fall under the category of making it easy. Um, and I think that uh, the University of Waterloo, uh, like others, they have small grants for pedagogical research, $1,000, larger grants, $10,000. It's worthwhile for, as for the institution to identify sources of funding uh, to make that easy so people don't have to try to root that out. In some institutions, there are endowments. Wouldn't that be great if we had an endowment that, that was able to fund scholarship of teaching and learning activity as it does in, at Mount Royal University? In some cases, we see that there are themed, uh, that themed work is sponsored by foundations. Those are few and far between in Canada. We know that. But there are also examples of professional societies, nursing, accounting, where the, the society itself supports um, the scholarship of teaching and learning. Ideally, I think what we're after is small seed grants that would build to, uh, from a variety of sources, that could build to something larger. Uh, perhaps along the lines of a tri-agency grant would be, would be quite, would be quite, uh, quite nice. Um, under the category of making it valuable, I think that um, a, a lot of this has to do with increasing the profile, um, increasing visibility and understanding on campus about what this area of scholarship is about. Again, same could be said for community engaged scholarship. It's about aligning faculty roles and rewards with, the te with teaching and the view of teaching as scholarly work. And I think it falls to the, the wider community of scholars to ensure that the work that's being done is, is rigorous and of high quality. Um, we share standards for scholarly work. They're well known to us. We don't have to reinvent this. And Dan talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, so clear goals, adequate preparation, appropriate methods, significant results. Um, and of course, that doesn't mean statistically significant results. That means, does this work add consequentially to the field? Effective presentation, reflective critique. We know that, that and we share that common understanding, of, and we know that these standards are important. I think in, interpretations of, of rigor and quality have a lot to do with what our peers think. As Dan said yesterday, Dan Bernstein said yesterday, Faculty actually make up the rules um, when it comes to standards, um, when it comes to uh, how things count in terms of tenure and promotion. 
And I think here at the U of S, I actually think we're, in, we're fairly well positioned in, in that regard. Uh, and I'll give you a specific example. In a recent letter um, to the Learning Center from our chair of the Research and Scholarly Works Committee, so this is a chair of, our, of a, our, one of our university councils, one of our university council committees, Stephen Urquhart. I quote Stephen saying, simply put, good scholarship is good scholarship, and it should be considered as a contribution at the University of, of Saskatchewan based on its merits. So he's speaking specifically about the scholarship of teaching and learning. He goes on to say that the committee supports there being a greater understanding and acceptance of research in the scholarship of teaching and learning, and the development of standards by which meritorious subtle work contributes, contributions can be properly recognized and considered in collegial processes. So here we have a body of our peers on the Research, and Scholar Research Scholarly and Artistic Works Committee who are saying, yes, we see that, that this, is, this is scholarship. So I think that's particularly helpful. In terms of making it valuable um, and increasing visibility and profile, uh, there are ways that we can showcase and honor the activities of our colleagues by sharing this around campus. I like the idea that McMaster has of creating profiles, uh, making it easy for exchange and community building by, by creating a, a space on their website, a directory of profiles of people doing this work. And we have a similar start to that here at the U of S. I think that it's very, it, it, it seems quite clever to me that, that institutions will post preliminary findings. So rather than necessarily reading an entire peer-reviewed article, that you could go to uh, our website and be able to get a two-page document that tells you what's going on in a particular research project in scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, certainly holding conferences and symposia like we're doing today is a way to highlight uh, the work that we're involved in. It works well when it goes along with a written publication and, and one of our uh, strategies for this symposium has been to tie it to a, an issue of bridges. I think we, we need to give air time to the high profile uh, activity that, that we're engaged in, the national and international collaborations. And I'm pointing to um, our involvement in the Bayview Alliance, which Jim mentioned very briefly yesterday um, and so, so let me actually give a, a moment of, uh, of airtime to high profile collaborations. Um, we're in this Bayview Alliance with um, two of our U15 peers, Queens and UBC, as well as um, some new friends, uh, UC Davis, University of Kansas, the University of Texas at Austin. This is an alliance that was originally funded by the Carnegie Foundation uh, and very recently received a, a significant grant from the Sloan Foundation. And what we're up to here is that we're examining the kinds of leadership practices that best support the adoption of effective teaching methods with a focus on the STEM areas. And we're there uh, in this alliance with these very prestigious others by virtue of some of the hard work that Jim Greer has been doing to get us there. And it's an important, it's an important part of what we're doing. Uh, under the category of making it valuable, I wanted to talk about um, the fact that if we're going to instill value into the scholarship of teaching and learning, it's going to involve educating the decision makers. This is a phrase I stole from Barbara Holland. Barbara Holland was a visitor in the fall. Barbara Holland from Portland State University, a renowned expert in community engaged scholarship, talked about educating the decision makers and it, and it really stuck with me. Educating the decision makers, so this is colleagues, department heads, about what this work is and about how to identify markers of quality in the scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, specifically as it pertains to um, tenure and promotion, matters of collegial process. So we need to create the necessary and appropriate standards uh, in order to, and that, I think that's key, to move forward with the scholarship of teaching and learning, to make sure it's at the core and not on the margins. How many people in the Think Pair Share, just a show of hands, how many people, how many, of, to how many of you did this occur that one of our challenges um, is about finding a, a place for this inside the standards and inside the ways in which we value work. Okay, thank you. At first I only saw my colleague Michael's hand go up and I thought, what, what? Thank you. Um, I, I too see that, that um, it's a significant aspect. We have a new breed, newer for us, breed of appointments at the University of Saskatchewan known as academic program appointments. That's our terminology. These, these are positions in which the assignment of duties is more heavily weighted to teaching. And accordingly, the standards 
uh, in that area, the standards for, for scholarship fit very well with uh, focus on teaching and learning. So, but for more traditional appointments, one of the key questions is where does this fit? Where does the scholarship of teaching and learning get counted? Is it under teaching? Is it under research? Is it under service? Is it all three? Uh, at the U of S, uh, what is referred to as pedagogical research appears in an area, in, in, a, in what's called an area to be reviewed under the category of teaching for tenure stream appointments, so it's in there. It's also possible for people to make a case for this area of, of research under the category of teaching. I think the critical element there is that it's about, it's about making your case. And one could argue that it's a, it's a more significant case to be made when you're doing the scholarship of teaching and learning than when you're in your core um, uh, inquiry uh, disciplinary area. We know at the U of S, however, that the first level of evaluation is often departments. Um, and here the application of standards is about interpretation and it's about academic culture. So we have to start asking questions about how is the weighting done in, the, in terms of the scholarship of teaching and learning compared to my disciplinary uh, approach to research. What are the expectations in, in this regard? And, and the challenge comes with the fact that the acceptance of the scholarship of teaching and learning varies across disciplines. So there's, there's no question that we have work to do here at the U of S on value and evaluation of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Pat Hutchins has pointed out that, that, that the research on teaching and learning has to be clearly positioned inside reward systems and not go under the radar. So if we're going to ask faculty members, if we're going to encourage them to do this work, it has to be a sustainable element of their work. Um, and, and in doing so, we're going to need some more senior colleagues who are prepared to engage in the discussions to help navigate the way for newcomers, no question. We're also going to need some upper level leadership um, to get discussions going, debate going, encourage new ways of thinking. Let me turn to um, another uh, aspect. Um, sorry, that was the last part, leaders and champions. Uh, oh, sorry, let me, no, I'm on track. Let me turn to another part and suggest that to help us move uh, towards excellence in the scholarship of teaching and learning, we're going to need to identify and build on our, our areas of strength. Uh, I think, I have to say, this is, this is one of my favorite parts of thinking about this, building on our areas of strength. We're going to need some subtle leaders and champions in our community. Uh, that, are th that are going to um, enhance our efforts. We have talked about creating positions of uh, teaching and learning scholars or fellows. This is an idea, this is not a new idea, this is an idea that one of my predecessors, Angela Ward, um, started with. I think it's a good one. Interestingly, the people that are drawn to the scholarship of teaching and learning and the people that understand the value of that work um, are also those drawn to highly engaging, high impact practices. And so one place, one very ready place for us to start in assembling this group of scholars or fellows is our growing list of award winning instructors, um, both locally as well as outside of our institution. I think a pivotal aspect of our efforts to bring the scholarship of teaching and learning into the core of our academic culture is going to be identifying focal areas. What are the focal areas of pedagogical research that, that will be um, main themes inside the University of Saskatchewan? And this is a strategy, by the way, that we've used very successfully across our campus in identifying what, what many of you will, will automatically know as our signature areas. When we went about this um, uh, task of over many years of identifying our signature areas, it was about trying to achieve sustainable and preeminent research impact. That was the driving force behind that, going beyond the single individual or unit to advance the university as a whole. I think the same approach can be taken by us in the scholarship of teaching and learning. There are, in my mind, a couple of clear possibilities that we could consider as focal areas inside the scholarship of teaching and learning. One of those is Aboriginal education and Indigenous pedagogies. And I'm including here, just as examples, such things as uh, land or place-based education, personal narratives in knowledge transmission and transformation, connections to community life and values, learning, about authentic, learning through authentic experiences. And an obvious home for this work would be our own uh, Aboriginal Education Research Centre. 
Um, I put on here, oh, oh, and sorry, I wanted to suggest to you that the U of S has a critical mass of expertise in this first area. Arguably, some of the best scholars in the country are here at the U of S. So that's a possible area, focal area for us. I wanted to put up experiential learning as a, as a focal area, possible focal area. Could be community service learning. We've got a network of community engaged scholars already um, who could come together on this. Could be undergraduate research. Uh, we have emerging initiatives coming from the, from the Office of the Vice President Research, and, and I'm working on those, and I have to tell you that I see a, a welcome uh, opportunity to wrap the scholarship of teaching and learning around those initiatives um, so that we have a, a more fulsome approach. A possibility is to look at instructional approaches, including learning technologies that are being used in much of the distributed learning approach that we have. This approach, this distributed learning approach, becoming a hallmark for us, especially in health science areas like nursing and medicine. What I find particularly appealing about these, about these possibilities, um, I have to remember, I have to, point, I have to put my finger on the light before I move the wand back and forth, but what I find particularly appealing about these possible directions is that it concentrates our attention with regard to the scholarship of teaching and learning towards things that are of institutional priority as well. It ties together. Um, we, we're able to build around individual faculty interests around inquiry and improvement with institutional needs for information about practice and high quality results. And as we consider, right, these are just possibilities. And as we consider and develop focal areas, of course we will want to look across the environment, look at our U15 peers. Are there some of these areas in which others are actively engaged so that we might collaborate or plug into existing work? And are there areas in which we want to lead? as an institution, right? Those are some of the things that we'll want to talk about. I think that one of the keys to identifying and building strengths, and, and I think Cheryl hit on this a little bit, or, or I am tying into some of what Cheryl was saying when she talked about the enthusiasm of bringing people together, is that to build on strengths, one of the ways to do that is to create groups and communities of, uh, communities of scholars. So at the University of Waterloo, they talk about teaching-based research groups. Um, some people call these communities of practice. At McMaster, they create communities of practice as a step towards bringing people together who wouldn't otherwise normally be in contact. Right? So this is, there's, there's an excitement, and that's what Cheryl was alluding to. There's an excitement of, of bringing people together, getting people talking. Um, there is a, a synergy around uh, research and research ideas. But built into that, which is, I think, an important thing for us, is that we know that getting people to adopt uh, best practice is a challenge. So you can read it doesn't mean you're going to do it in your classroom. Um, but beyond simply teaching people about best practice, when you pull these communities together, what you have is the capacity that to, to actually get people to adopt recommendations. Um, they're more likely to trust things that come from their network and to try them out and feel safer in trying them out in their classrooms. So I think the creation of these clusters or teams would help us to build strength in a focal area, become powerful and lead in a focal area, but also would help us to effectively translate the research we're doing into practice. So, this morning, I've provided you uh, with uh, a beginning vision of how we will move to position the scholarship of teaching and learning as a vital and highly regarded component of research mission at the University of Saskatchewan. I've talked a little bit about our local starting point, gave you some, some general principles that I think are applicable here about cultivating activity and excellence. Some of those included making it easier, making it valuable and more visible, identifying and building on our strengths. And I'd like to conclude um, with two additional pieces of advice that, that Pat Hutchings, Mary Huber, and Anthony Ciccone offer in their recent book, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Reconsidered. They offer more than two pieces, by the way, and it's a, it's a good read. But these two I saved to the end because I think they're at a higher, uh, higher level. So, so Pat and colleagues argue that the university is strongest when there is a larger shared agenda for student learning and success. And if we are to succeed with a vision of repositioning the scholarship of teaching and learning, the scholarship of, of community engagement, if we are to succeed, then we have to be part of that larger shared agenda. 
Uh, if we are to succeed in moving the vision forward, we're going to need sustained leadership, we're going to need some creativity and some flexibility. And you won't be surprised to hear me say that I think we're positioned to do this work. I think we're ready to do this work. And so I thank you. And because I didn't want to poke fun at my colleagues, I did want to offer you a photo of me. <laughs> this is how I looked in the 90s when I arrived. <laughs> To, to complete my PhD and to begin my work as a sessional instructor. And we're going to take that off before this gets posted anywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patty. Uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, if there are some questions in the audience. Uh, do you want to use the microphone, Carolyn? Thank you. So we were having a great conversation, um, Bev and I, about the idea that teams give strength to it. And this is back when you had to think fair share. But one of the challenges we were talking about is in, in particular areas, being second or third author on a paper is counted less than being first author. Right. So not only is there a challenge of saying scholarship or teaching and learning, work is equally valid to discovery research, but oftentimes being second or third author can actually um, be a challenge when you're going up for, for promotion sure. tenure renewal. For sure. So how, when you're talking about considering changing the culture around recognition, it would actually have to be almost two-pronged. So how, right. what would you see as being an approach to addressing right. that kind of concern? Right. So, so Carolyn, you're talking about you're talking about collaborative work, and of course, and, and interestingly, uh, we have collaborative work all over the campus, right? So it's not we it's not just the scholarship of teaching and learning where we where we find that, but it's again I go back to the notion of educating the decision maker. So um, many people will go for a, a personnel or a career related decision, and inside their their portfolio they will have. Um, perhaps solo authored work, they will have first authored work, they will have junior authored work. And I think that it fits with the idea of having to make your case. Um, you have to speak to the contributions that you made um, when you're in a junior authored position. Um, you have to be, uh, so, so that's the you, that's the candidate going forward. And then the people on the receiving end have to be, despite their own disciplinary training and background, have to know enough to be able to recognize that there is quality in those contributions, right? And that's a, that's a, there's no question that's a tough one. So in, in my own work, uh, 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 previously at St. Thomas More College, where, where we teach in, in the humanities and the social sciences, it was, it was interesting um, to see those who came forward with really just a solo, what I would call a solo scholar model. And, and fortunately, we had opportunities inside uh, STM to come together and for colleagues to teach colleagues about how to still be able to recognize rigor and quality inside that work. So I think it can be done, but I think conversations need to be had. And I, do, I still think that um, for, for the foreseeable future, candidates will have to um, make strong arguments on their own behalf and will have to lean on senior mentors and colleagues to help them do that. Great point. Uh, I think we have about one more minute or two. Uh, any other questions for Patty today? No? There's one. Thank you. Just, just following up on that point about uh, standards, um, scholarship of teaching and learning is something that, is, that transcends boundaries. So it's kind of research without boundaries in, in that sense. Um, what if I, from the business school, work with somebody in chemistry and we are doing work on scholarship of teaching and learning? I think, you know, previously you pointed out that standards are developed at the departmental level and they are a bottom-up approach. Uh, but I think somewhere some intervention is required to ensure that collaboration that happens from scholars that are in two different colleges units of campus should have recognition. And, and that is something that, you know, the, at the department le at level, the blinders have to be taken off. But I think for that to happen, some intervention from administrative units is probably useful. I think, I think it's 
it's a team-based approach, right? And, and it's interesting what you're describing. <gasps> Imagine someone from the School of Business, you know, working on something. Was it, was it chemistry? I'm sorry. What was the... Yes. Yes, um, it's perfect. Imagine, imagine. Um, that, that should be, by the way, one of our uh, outcome measures um, in five years' time. It, it, in, if we follow along the vision that I'm talking about, we should, be, we should be able to point to hirings of people that we brought to the institution because of their expertise in the scholarship of teaching and learning, and we should be readily able to point to examples of, of the kinds of collaborations exactly that you're talking about. And, and, and I am inspired by the work that's going around, on around team science right, because it speaks exactly to the sort of thing. And this is about inquiry-based, scholarship of inquiry or scholarship of discovery. So I, I guess I am, um, I feel greater confidence that we're going into this large, across campus and it's not just one little interest group going into this, we're going into this broadly. So I do agree that um, there needs to be some leadership getting some of these debates and discussions going, but I think we also both recognize, you and I, that there has to be, has to be a colleague speaking to colleague about this as well to get those, as you said, quite aptly to remove the blinders. I think it's a great, it's, I think you answered your own question, and I really appreciate that. With that, I think we should thank Patty again for her wonderful presentation.